Welcome to the Greyhawk DJC podcast. In today's podcast, we talk with Jeff Francis, Chief Information Officer with Healthcare Associates of Texas. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Dave. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. All right. Well, thanks for doing this. I know it's been a long time we've been talking about this. Yeah. But thanks for coming out to the show. It's my pleasure. Happy to do it. All right. Well, typically we start off by getting to know you better. So um, tell us about, you know, where you're from, where you grew up, where you went to school, family, all that stuff. All right. Uh, So I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay. Um, And kind of skipping through... um, Ended up being a band nerd, played saxophone, mm. uh, got to go to a kind of an arts high school. Okay. Um, I studied hard, tried to get good grades, just because I was mostly afraid to fail anything. So um, do most people from Baton Rouge sound like you? Because you have no, no accent. I mean. Yeah, so, I, I, um, so during that time, my dad lived a few places up mm-hmm. north, and I, I would spend summers and holidays, and I think going back and forth between... Uh, Louisiana and Michigan, um, I sort of lost my accent. You right. know, I would flip flop. Okay. And so it's kind of evened out over could, time. Could you do one if you could? I it it would be embarrassing. <laughs> okay. Um, when I go back to Louisiana, my accent starts as soon as we cross there the state line. All right. And I have to catch myself. Yeah. Sure. Sure. All right. So you're in high school. In high school, yeah. um, uh. Played a lot of uh, jazz because we had good jazz programs there. Mm-hmm. Uh, loved music, um, and from there I had some family that had gone to Baylor okay. uh, here in Texas. And the way it all worked out, ended up going there with the thought that a music <laughs> education degree mm-hmm. would be a way to not become a starving musician outside of college. Okay. Um, so studied music, um, got a bachelor's. Uh, music education. Mm-hmm. Um, Were you thinking about what you would do afterwards with that? Totally, and had no idea. Okay. Um, I knew by the time I graduated that I didn't want to be a music teacher. What happened uh, in the meantime that made you think that? It was really student teaching. Okay. Um, and it's not like, I mean, I have the utmost respect for teachers. What I s- started to realize is just I'm not going to be good at it. <laughs> And but did other people tell you this, or you just kind of felt that? I, fi- I kind of felt that. Okay. Um, the The music program is really one of the just uh, best times of my life. Mm-hmm. You know, loved playing music. Um, I had this sense that I wasn't um, like I knew who the really talented people were. Mm-hmm. You know, there are people that are just gifted in anything. Right. And when you see a talented musician. I had to. I always felt like I had to grind a lot harder to play, uh, hopefully as good or approaching as good as people mm-hmm. that were really talented. What was your instrument? Uh, saxophone. Okay. Um, and then on the teaching side, student teaching really makes it real for you um, in middle schools, in high schools, and uh, what I I think what did it was I knew I didn't want to direct marching bands. Okay. It's not really my my style, my okay. jam, um, and you know the school system is a it's a hard pl- it's a hard job. There's still lots of politics and lots of stuff. So parents, I just sort of yeah. knew uh, I didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know at that time a starting teacher made very little, so it was pretty easy to imagine starting jobs. In, right just anything else right um got married about that time um how old are you now when you got 23 married? wow um we moved to houston so we had family there mm-hmm. uh, i got a job at a bank as a loan underwriter for in like a call center how do you get that job if you have a music degree uh luckily mm-hmm. uh, we just went to like this big um what group interview managed to get through um, sucked at that job. Okay. It was very production heavy. Um, and I was, what, what I started to learn there is I liked to f- solve problems. Mm-hmm. You know, if there was a, a loan application that should probably just get thrown out, move on, I, I wanted to find a way to make it work. Okay. Um, learned a lot of basics of just what, what it's like to work in a large company and all that stuff. Um, 
and I guess kind of flying through it. Um, about that time, my mother-in-law um, was helping my brother-in-law go get computer certification. Okay. And I think like a good mother-in-law didn't really see me out there with any great prospects. And okay. she, so she offered, hey, I'll help you get certification if if you want to do it. And this was in uh, 98, 90, yeah, 98. And you have no background in this? No background in computers. No, have no idea what that is? No idea. Okay. Um, but it seemed really interesting. Um and so I went to the same, uh, this was back when Microsoft, um, in the late 90s, the Microsoft certifications were becoming a, a real kind of mainstream thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and people were actually career changing. And so you had these private or uh, for-profit schools popping up all over and you could right. go and get certified. And so I quit my job. The the, the the, the judgment call there was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go all in and do it. Right. And so my wife um, uh, switched her job to make more money, mm-hmm. a little bit more money. Um, and we, uh, and, and I began this school kind of full time. So you're not working at this time. Not either. working. So two of you, one income while one you're going income. to school. Yeah, okay. and, and we mo- actually moved into like a guest house at, um, at my uh, father-in-law's, my mother-in-law's place. Wow, okay. Uh, so we, yeah, just tried to live cheap. So if you don't finish this, like you're, you're on the hook for this, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it was, this was a, it was a big commitment. I guess thinking about it that way, it was mm-hmm. a bit of a do or die situation. Okay. Um, but you never thought that, or did it, you? I, I guess I don't remember. What I do remember is... I fell in love with um, learning all the technology stuff. I fell in love with um, that. You know, I didn't know I was a nerd, really. But did that surprise you? It. I think it did because there, there's an element. What started to become really apparent was I liked to, to problem solve things, mm-hmm. and IT was just a framework for that, a great framework for that because we all have computers. It's always breaking. Right. Um, but you, you experienced this, but you never had this happen to you growing up. You didn't think this is what you're going to do, right? No, I never. I never thought com- computer stuff. You know, this is back like in colleges in that day. Like we had all the original Apple, right? You know, computers. You're, you know, basically word processors and sending emails or whatever. Um, I didn't graduate with any idea of that. Which I think is true for so many people, man. And it doesn't matter what your degree is. How many of us end up? still just kind of wondering what we're going to do, what we're going to love. Um, and this was one of those turns of fate um, or blessing, whatever, that ends up landing. Um, about that same time, um, my wife and I, we'd been in this, we were both uh, in the South really our whole life, and we wanted to just go live somewhere else. So we... Um, my poor parent, uh, dad had, and stepmom had bought me a truck, and so we sold that. I only had it for maybe a year. Okay. Uh, sold it to get enough money to move to Boston. Why Boston? Um, because we had some friends there. Okay. And we were thinking maybe the Northwest too, but we went and visited Boston in May, and it's Boston in May is beautiful. All right. Um, so by October of that year, we had sold the truck, packed everything up, and drove across the country to get there. Are you there. still in school? I had finished. Sorry, okay. I, had, I had finished my certification. Right. I kind of took a fast track through it. Okay. Um, Any we, jobs up in Boston? No jobs, oh, just yeah. rent. All right. Uh, I still remember it was thirteen twenty-five, and it was the scariest thing I remember. Right. I mean, we all have those stories, you right. know, these young times, right? Um, we. Moved up there and I started applying for jobs. Um, ended up um, getting an offer, wasn't really great. I'd, I'd found a company I wanted to work for, and this was one of those points I look back on and think, man, this is pivotal for my life. Mm-hmm. Um, turned down an offer to kind of hold out. I was hoping this one company was going to call me. What back. are these jobs? About uh, help desk. Okay. That's a great question. Just entry level help desk. So that's all I am at this point, right. is like, Buck private IT guy, no experience, right. music major, no one understands that. Uh-huh. Um, and 
uh, got my first help desk job at a small company, small health healthcare company. All right. It was growing pretty fast. It was a private equity backed company. I didn't know what any of that would mean at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and also by just sheer luck and blessing, ended up getting a boss that became like uh, a major mentor. To How me. long did it take you to get the job when you moved to Boston? I started. So when rent starts to the time you start working? Yeah, I guess we got there in October. Um, it was a couple months because okay. it was scary. Right. Um, you, you guys worried that now you need to get some income coming in? Yeah. Okay. All right. it, yeah. And we had no good answers for any of our family. Um, was there a lot of pushback for that? You going up there? I think the norm, being a parent now, the normal amount yeah. of pushback. Okay. What are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Right. Um, but yeah, so I, I got this job. Um, was just amazingly stoked. And started uh, doing entry level IT stuff, working on, you know, laptops and PCs. Are you actually fixing them, or you answering yeah. phone calls? Like, what's your typical day like at that um, point? Typical day might be. I mean, this is going back in the technology days, but um, yeah, there's a component on a computer that you need to replace, mm-hmm. or you're going over to someone's computer and trying to figure right. out why some software is not working right. and all that stuff, uninstalling, reinstalling stuff. Did the stuff you learned in certification help you? It, it really did. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, and actually, I I think uh, the my early IT career is still very similar to what an entry-level IT job is like today. Mm -hmm. You're working a help desk, so tickets are coming in somehow, or calls are coming in somehow. And I I believe still that it's a a valid place to start a career. Right. Like that's- Explain, yeah. Yeah, so in in a help desk, I mean, I guess there's so many ways, right, to get started in a career. But in a help desk, I think you have to learn. So it's like a high pressure thing, like many Mm -hmm. uh, situations. But um, as as you are given an uh, you know any number of problems are going to come across your plate, each one of them is a bit of a customer service experience you have to manage and mitigate. So you have this opportunity to figure out how to relate to people, um, talk them off the edge. Um, understand what their problem is, even though they can't really describe it to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's this communication training that goes along with it. And then you're learning these technical skills. Um, right. I, th- I think what, what was unique a little bit, or what I think I would encourage people to look for in an IT job, is look for a company that's growing um, and where you can sense uh, paths to increase your expertise, like exposure to certain technologies, right, right. you know, um, which is, is probably nothing new. But where, where I was, um, they were getting into um, uh, some newer technologies at the time, Citrix, which is still around. And I had people that were uh, open to talking and very comfortable sort of they needed help right Right. so it's like hey man can you learn this or there was some stuff that no one was even working on and so i think in a computer department an it department there's always a number of projects that no one can touch yet Mm -hmm. i guess that's part of it you know even if it's like if you ever worked in a company and you have like some shared drive and if that shared drive has existed for like three months it's now a disorganized wreck and so you can go, well, all right, hey, maybe I can work. Hey, how about I organize this? Right. Right. I feel like IT is one of those places where there's just always a lot of work there. A lot of it you can kind of do on your own. So you just took the initiative to kind of fix some of these things. Yeah. Where did that come from? Just- um, I don't know. That's a hard question to answer. I'll tell you what did happen, though, that's always stuck with me. Um, my boss at the time, mm-hmm. who I, I still call him my mentor, uh, one of my mentors, he uh, instilled a couple things. One of them was show up to every day at work like you're a consultant. Like you're in a business of, for, for, for yourself. Your customer is the company you work for. Um, and so you need to do uh, 
a couple things. Identify what's valuable to them and then get it done. And if you do that, because his lesson at the time was the workplace is changing. There's no longer this work at a place for 50 years and right. retire with a fat pension. It's work like a consultant and focus on what's valuable. And he goes, to, the real trick there is figuring out what's valuable. And um, that stuck with me. Um, what was the other thing? Well, it'll come to me. But I, I think that created a foundation for looking for those things, you know. Um, and because there was so much happening in IT at that time, too, it created this great way to kind of just grow and learn. And by the time I exited that company, I, you know, I, I was legitimately a, like a senior system administrator. How long were you there for? Uh, I was there for six years. Okay. Wow. it's a long time. Um, yeah. yeah. And it, it, what also happened there, too, is it was a private equity-backed company. And so they were growing fast, lots of projects. Um, and I got to live through some of that, and that was very eye-opening. You know, the sort of business of business, um, where you are rewarded for having an entrepreneurial spirit. Oh, that's what I was going to say. He really fostered this idea of even though you're working in a company, there's a lot of latitude to approach your job like an entrepreneur. Um, like, what if you owned it? Sure. You know? And I, I think because he was supportive of that, it helped me realize that it's it's okay to show up to a job where you're just a cog in the wheel in some ways and not think of yourself that way, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so anyway, so I, I got a lot of technical experience, which was uh, valuable for sort of career and market. Um, that company sold to a company here in Dallas. Okay. Um, and uh, they put in lots of good words for me, mm -hmm. I was able to move down here with that uh, to a job with that company, um, and ended up back into kind of a bigger machine. You okay. know, one of uh, a couple hundred people in IT. That was a big eye opener for me, and it was kind of a different season of of sort of my journey. Okay, it was how do you end up buried in a, in a department and do all these things that were very easy to do in a small company, sure. right? You, where you can look around and see opportunity and grow and you're not fighting over who owns what technology. Um, so you have a new role, a new title? I have a new role. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still a senior system administrator, mm -hmm. but due to the organizational structure of the company, um, and also because I was kind of coming in from an acquisition, it was just a bit awkward maybe, okay. right? Um, and it took some time for all that to shake out. And um, Did they let go a lot of people from your old company? Um, no, they kept a lot of people there because okay. it was like a growth acquisition sure. for them. Sure. Um, some of the corporate jobs went away, right, like right. the IT department up there and stuff yeah. like that. But uh, most of it stayed around. Um, so here I am in Dallas. Um, and I... This whole season, I could just summarize it like this. It was it was very transformational for me, mm -hmm. right? Um, I also had another really great boss um, that I think is a huge part of my story, you know. Um, but uh, one of the guys I worked with, uh, he I, I tend to get very philosophical. He also kind of a very philosophical guy. And one day, we're sitting around, and he told me what his mentor taught him, and he said that leadership. Uh, uh, I mean, I'll take a step back. In a company like that, all of a sudden your title really matters because your title is promotions and advancement. Sure. And there's just layers upon layers, right? When can you become a team lead or manager or supervisor or director? Mm -hmm. And so, but those are obviously highly coveted positions. And so how do you grind through that? And mm -hmm. what he told me, his mentor taught him, it's also stuck with me, is leadership is a role, not a goal. And the way he explained what that meant to him um, and the way I explain it to is leadership is a thing you decide to do and be. It's a, it's a role you decide to play, not a goal you hope to get to. Wow. And that really kind of shook me, mm -hmm. you know, because I've, at that time I feel like I was competing to try to get a title, uh, mostly because I had two small kids and wanted to have a bigger paycheck probably, right? right? Yeah. 
Um, some desire, I think, to make important decisions or have a, some say in decision making, like we all have at our jobs, right? right? But that really kind of shook me and forced me to kind of step back and think, okay, if I don't have a title, don't know if I'll ever get a title, what do I want to do with my job? Mm -hmm. How can I still take what was instilled in me early on about being entrepreneurial and... Are you managing people right now? Um, kind of. I was like a team lead. Okay. Right. You know, like unofficially, if you're the senior engineer on a team, then, you know, some decisions and okay. stuff flows through you. But whatever. no administrative... No, no, no Peter, real, real okay, manager okay. title. All right. Um, and I think I was probably in that role for a couple of years okay. in that kind of position. You know, your typical sort of story when you're in those roles and you, you can't find an executive or, or a director or a VP that's making decisions you agree with, you yep. know. Yep. Um, I'm not saying I'm right either, <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah, um, but I think it changed my focus on just trying to look for areas to add value still, be mm -hmm. entrepreneurial. How can I um, influence things that I think need to happen, even when I have no control? That's how I characterize that whole sort of large company experience. Right, right. right? And I feel like it was such good training, you know? Um, so anyway, let me, I guess I'll fast forward through a couple years. Eventually I do get a director title there. Okay. Um, and I'm responsible over several technology teams, um, system administrators, databases and stuff. Um, Were they grooming you or did you just, was it a surprise that happened? Man, I don't know. I, my boss was very well respected. Mm -hmm. So it's probably just as much about the job I was doing as it was his reputation too. Okay. Um, or his choice even, you know. Uh, but I I think what I, what, what I remember about that is... Once I had the title, nothing really got easier. Right. And what I was really thankful for is I had spent so long trying to build influential relationships with people when I had no title. When I could walk into their office and just say, hey, what do you think about this? Like, do you think this is the right way to go or do you think we should be doing something else? And talking all those things through. You mm -hmm. know, we still had a lot of stuff going on. And, and maybe that that realization of uh, kind of led me to this little mantra that I've kind of always had, right? Um, thinking about le leadership, uh, I, I boil leadership down into a, really just two things. Uh, it has lots of components, but at a high level, I think of it as being observant and then being influential. And that job taught me those things. How do you stay observant and, and just watching what's around you, watching not just events and decisions, but watching who, who people are and paying attention to what their motivations are, what they like, don't like, what they're, um, what they're hedging against, what they're angling for. Just be observant. What, what, how, how complex is the situation? Right. Um, and then um, really trying to think through just how to be influential, you know? Um, and then deciding to tackle what those influential things are. And so there, that progression of, of kind of what was from my perspective, grinding it out, um, and then getting a title and then still having to grind out the same things. All right, what do we need to do? Do I know? Uh, do I not know? How do I find out? And then how do I be, influ be influential through people with it? What were your toughest challenges at this time? Um... Let's, let's see. There it, it was, every decision required so many people, you know? Um, so, and I, and I remember at the time I thought we were making some risky project decisions mm -hmm. that I wanted to try to influence. And now it sounds very sort of generic and general, right? Um, I think it was how to create agreement amongst people. That was probably one of the biggest things on what we should do and then how to elevate that story through leadership in the right way. It's probably the biggest challenge. Okay. I don't think I even necessarily even did it right a lot. Right. Um, but, uh, and then the technology piece, I mean, just from a, a nerd standpoint, um, all that stuff was going pretty easy. 
I had a lot of great guys that I've worked with, the guys that worked for me. Um, Are you still constantly studying, learning new stuff, coming down the pipeline? You, it, you end up doing that just because versions change and right. things upgrade. Okay. Uh, but mostly uh, starting in about 2010, 2011 now, um, I was transitioning away from all that and mostly in meetings and decision right. making and all right. that and wondering like, am I ever going to be relevant? What, what is this? What, what happens? Anyway, as the story goes, the way that kind of turns out, um, the uh, CEO of the company I was at in Boston um, was working with another private equity group and had uh, another company early in its stages of growth here in Dallas. Okay. And he asked me to come over and be a vice president of IT. So he just, by luck, happened to move to Dallas. I, I guess, yeah. Just, the private equity group right. had had bought a company and they were trying to grow it. He was the CEO at that time, mm -hmm. operating that, that capacity. Um, I think he offered the job to my mentor in Boston, who obviously business relationships, uh, you know, last. Right. Uh, um, and he didn't want to travel. So then uh, my name was sort of thrown out there as I think you should offer it to Jeff. Okay. Um, and so he took a bit of a risk on me. Uh, and this was a, a bit of a scary moment just from that standpoint. Right. I was, the you know, uh, it's a small company, although they had like 15 locations. And I was going to be their first internal IT guy. Mm -hmm. They had everything hosted to other people. And it was, my goal there was to build a department and establish an IT direction and strategy. Okay. He's all felt a bit over my head, right? you know? And I remember that feeling of, man, all the decisions I've thought were horrible that other people made, uh -huh. now I've got no one to blame, right? right. Yep. Um, but it was that perfect opportunity. I mean, talk about feeling entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that felt really good, even though it was scary. Um, thankfully, I managed to hire some great guys and start building a team. Um, and maybe fast forwarding through all that, that whole season, I think I learned so much about how useful, how rewarding it is to be able to build a department and create a culture at work, you know? Where wow. did you get like, I wanna say like maybe inspiration mm. to hire a team, to know you're getting the right guys? Like, where's that jumping off point? Some of it's yeah. really just luck and practical. You know, one of the guys, we were at, so the first we were a team of three people for mm -hmm. a while. Um, and one guy was a referral from someone else. You know, someone said, hey, this is a good guy, you should hire him. And I'm like, all right, I don't know anybody better. Sure. So yes, another was a guy that worked with me at my previous company okay. who I knew, um, I knew had what it took because when you work at a small company in IT, you cannot ever worry about what your job title or role is. Right. <laughs> you know, you just do what has to be done. Um, I've had many days in my career as a CIO where I laugh because I'm literally under a desk, you know, checking some cable being plugged in. Sure. And not, you know, think hashtag CIO life, you know? Yeah, right. Um, and so I think that takes a, a different, unique just kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, so I started with those, we started this team of three. Um, did I answer your question? It was, what, what's, where, where do you get the inspiration? Yeah. I think it's mostly um, just knowing you wanna work with people that have a, a drive to do, and that sounds cheesy, but it's that simple, All right. right? Do they have a drive to do courage in making decisions? Um, are they, um, are they comfortable with uh, failing forward? Okay. You know, like awesome. sometimes it's like, okay, I'm, I might just fall on my face. Right. But I still made some progress, you know? Right. And I think that's a skill set I learned and had in, instilled in me. Um, and it's something that, you know, in this day and age, in this stage of my career, I try to give people the comfort for. You know, I had leaders that would say, like when you're facing some major uh, implementation and it's your finger as the IT guy on the button mm -hmm. and you're clicking go, 
And you know, like, this thing is going to install, it's going to reboot, and I hope it comes back up, right? Have, have you had, uh, how about this, can you think of a major failure where you fell forward? You oh, think? yeah, and I don't know if I can get, um, well, from a technology standpoint, sure. I mean, at the, at the company I worked for here, when we moved mm. back to Dallas, we had, I mean, thousands of users, and my team was responsible f- if if my team's technology broke, nobody could get in. So did, did it ever break? Yeah, okay. I mean, of course. <laughs> I I know I had changes that brought down the entire company. Oh know? wow! Okay. And you know you're implementing something and it just goes wrong, and all of a sudden your servers aren't starting or they're not not launching right. And so yeah, feeling the weight of you know probably at least six thousand users who can't log in, and you got doctors and there's patients in waiting rooms, and you know that's it. That scary moment. So I think I'd had a lot of that experience okay. and had been accustomed to some of that. Sure. Um, so when that happens, what are you doing or what are you thinking? Is it was it was it, was it exactly the things that you did that made that happen, or was it just some other outside? No, these in, would be things I did because okay. it, it you know, and I, I I don't have a good specific example to sure. give you on some of that technology stuff uh, from that time. But it's always something maybe you could have tested or found. Sometimes it's dumb luck, you know. Okay. Um, but I I do think that maybe I'm going back into sort of uh, merits of an IT career and even starting off at a help desk. I mm-hmm. mean, you're encountering those times when y- you might just break this thing, okay. you know. And I, I think that is good experience because you have to have that kind of decision making sure. confidence in order sure. to get through. Um, so you don't I, you don't believe guys that go I've never broken anything. No, no. of course not. Right. I mean, does anybody even invent anything without? <laughs> That's right. Failing, you know. That's right. Um, I, you know, I think too, like um, my experience in music, I've thought over the years, mm-hmm. um, kind of ties into some of my approach to that. The first time you play a piece of music, it's gonna be maybe not the worst, but near the worst time you <laughs> yeah. play it, right? And uh, I think the arts do this a lot. Um, they, they teach you that there's a natural grind to making things great, you know? Um, you, until you put the time in the woodshed, as like my jazz director in college would always say, like, like stop playing. You got to go spend some more time in the woodshed just chopping wood, you right. know? Right, right. Um, I think I brought it up only because you see so many people there they're unwilling to fail mm. or they're afraid of failure, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I think I saw like a Shark Tank episode and one of the guys pitching was like, you know, I've never had a campaign, I'd never failed in my old job as a, as a C-level person. And one of the sharks are like, well, then I don't want you. Right, You right. need someone that has failed and gone through the misery and yeah. picked themselves back up and stuff. And so I, it seems like your job is just constant ebb and flow of that i mean i feel like that i think it's fair okay. and i'm only sheepish about saying it. i think maybe because i don't know what other paths are like right? right but just speaking from an it standpoint i think every it person has made the choice that brought something down sure and you're like oh man what did i do or i mean even at this stage in my career it it hasn't stopped mm-hmm. and um at, at uh, this place, Epic Health Services, we were at, um, where I was now the only IT guy, the IT director at the time, building this department, had to make some intense decisions. Like we needed to move to a software platform. We're a very niche, niche uh, healthcare business. So all the products are basically startups. Um, we needed to implement a data center, you know, that could support um, the growth of the company right. and a lot of those decisions where I'm signing the contracts or in some cases I can't even because mm-hmm. a CFO has to do it. I don't have the authority to commit that much money. It really is do or die. And right. you know that I've committed to a path that I have to make work. Right. You right. know, um, I, I think there's that, uh, 
if you look for them, this is one of those things where, and I've watched some of your videos and I've always had this huge respect for entrepreneurial people, actual entrepreneurs, right? That kind of, you know, risk their savings, start a business. Right. I've never felt like I had the courage to do that. But I think for those of us that find ourselves in the professional grind, I think there's um, opportunities for us to approach that professional grind with an entrepreneurial attitude. And it won't always work out at every gig, mm -hmm. right? At every job. Um, certainly I was lucky. But if you approach it that way, I think you can find those oppor the, those op op entrepreneurial opportunities and end up getting in those positions right, where right. you can really experience that same, I'm, I'm betting it all. Like there's only one person they're firing if we go this right, way, you know, right. or if it doesn't work out. So you, as a C-level exec, though, I've always wanted to ask. Sure. Can you hear the mumblings of people that mm. are working for you? Because sure. I personally have never done that, right? Yeah. You get to a certain level and all you hear is people complaining about their job. Mm. They don't understand us. They're just in their lofty offices. Like, do you hear the grumblings or are you too busy on a day-to-day -day level to... Well, your question sounds yeah. twofold, right? Yeah. It sounds like me personally, but then uh -huh. also speaking kind of generally about the culture of executive leadership in yep. our in our in our country in our society or right. professional culture whatever you call it um, I think every executive knows right and I think leadership is one of those things that is really hard to do anyway at scale right there's a natural organizational size or complexity dynamic mm -hmm. that makes connections uh, between people and trust and communication just way more difficult and so yeah I I um, I feel like I notice it um, I, I'll be honest there are times probably every executive feels like I'm not sure what I can do about it right because you are having to juggle complex things business strategy investment strategy in a business mm -hmm. Um, what's good for for everyone that's a really difficult goal to hit um, and I think most people are really trying to do the best they can I'm sure there's a lot there's lots of headlines yeah certainly um, the private absolutely. equity world yeah. what toys are us yeah. you know things get crushed from for private equity profits but I know that uh, I've seen many people that really do care about that and feel the weight mm -hmm. of their decisions at that scale Right. Um, maybe I've been very, very fortunate too to work with people that I know really care deeply about it. Um, had those examples for me. Um, I do think as a as a leader, some of the things I've lived through are re when you realize that you are a caricature of yourself. You're the leadership caricature of yourself. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and I think good leaders embrace that. I mean, there's going to be times you know you're going to make a decision and your people are going to talk crap about you and you let you let them right mm -hmm. but you use that as fuel to try and make a connection because that's right. really what we all want you know we don't we know we're not going to agree with all the leadership decisions and we're going to murmur and we're going to sure. talk right but there are occasions when you live through that but you know that there's a genuine concern and interest and a value that's put on you from a leader, they can kind of make that toler tolerable. Right, right. I don't know. I mean, what do you think? How, how do you transition when you come home? Like, do you ever bring CIO Jeff home and then you get, you realize, no. I bring not nerd gonna... Jeff home and my <laughs> wife's eyes glaze over or my daughter rolls her eyes. Um, Is it hard to like, when you hang out with friends and stuff, do you still like, hey, I'm a CIO, but amongst the dudes, the guys, you're just... One of the guys that yeah. can take it, that have to take it as much as everybody else and, does, right? You know, it's funny, man. I, I think some of what I, I maybe am reading into that question, because at, at times I'm still uncomfortable calling myself an executive leader mm -hmm. and having other people call me that. Um, I am that, and I like being that. I mean, I'm doing my dream job and right. feel lucky and blessed to have it, right. you know? Um, So, but it's still, I, I don't, there's so many bad 
maybe or just negative also stereotypes that go along with that word, right. I think it creates a little bit of discomfort in me, you know, okay. to kind of like, so I don't feel like I transitioned a whole lot really, sure. honestly. And I, but I do feel like that was because, and maybe there's a message, maybe a message in this, it's that I think everybody I worked for that I would call a mentor was approachable, they were authentic, mm-hmm. and I think they just wanted to do their best to be a good leader, right, right? right? And setting that example. And then once you start off being a leader, if that's your goal, and then you actually see that, give people the kind of job where maybe they're taking home the stress of a really fast-paced project. They're taking home the stress of just more work than they can get done in the day or the stress of all their priorities change every you know every time they walk in the door or whatever you can't always fix that stress but you can remove a lot of stress from people's lives about all the other work crap that we have to deal with right you know right. and i've i've started to get very philosophical about just the the value as an executive right or just a leader in a company of creating that kind of space, you know? Uh, that's back to that leadership is a role, not a goal thing. Mm-hmm. You know, if I can just show up to work and it's very freeing and it is inspiring to think, um, I can't fix whole aspects of people's lives and the challenges they have going on, but I can make this place a place where they can uh, predict what's gonna happen. Sure, You know, absolutely. Um, and be comfortable, feel respected as a contributor, you know, all those things. So I think what makes your story interesting is, so you have a music background, you never thought you'd be where you are now, Yeah. and you didn't come in thinking, I'm going to be an exec one day, right? Sure. So I guess when people come into this, mm. they decide to do this, what, do you, what advice do you give people mm. who want to be in IT, I guess? Um, I, it, as cheesy as it sounds and I've also had to make my peace with this a okay. lot of stuff that's cheesy is still true right. <laughs> does that make sense? All right. um, there's a lot of cheesy stuff that is absolutely the right thing and um, I would say try try to be a leader mm-hmm. if not of people do it of things um, be focus on being observant, really paying attention. You know, a lot of times the things that are going on have larger reasons. And so be a person that is asking questions. You know, if you're buried in IT and there was a day when the sort of the business plan of a company treated IT like a utility, it didn't just like the plumbing, mm-hmm. right? Um, but ask yourself, what what is the business value of a process? What what does our company do? <laughs> right? Be observant and then try to be influential. And sometimes that's in a real small scale. But but look around and don't and kind of resist the professional aspects of professional culture that say that encourage you to be a cog in a wheel. Because maybe you have some leadership that doesn't listen or it's just never gonna change or whatever. Like mm-hmm. I, I think um, if you work at a place where your attempts to be observ- observant and, and influential aren't working, you're still changing and you're still learning. What kind yeah. of questions do you ask guys you're interviewing to try to get that or understand that? I ask how, um, have you, have you, it's a lot of the same stuff. Have you worked in a complex environment you feel like you've made an impact on, that kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Have you, um, have you led something that you're proud of proud of you when know? you when you were a lower level exec mm. and these were guys right out of certification school what were you looking for then i guess oh, like oh, like i was hiring people right um was looking for people that had owned something in the sense of when you ask them, tell me something you've done you're proud of, mm-hmm. whether that's work-related or not, where you can find someone who got really passionate about something and just did it. Okay. You know? Um, a lot of times, um, it was people with no IT experience. I, I think I think 
of me and and um, the managers that have worked for me um, have done a great job of taking people and career changing them into IT. A lot of times in a healthcare company like we are, you have people that have been a practice manager um, or a medical assistant or a nurse transition very well into IT roles. Um, and mostly, but in all of them, what you're looking for is they go, well, there was this process that you know wasn't working, right? Or, um, you know, I worked for this doctor and they didn't really get it, you know? And so I stopped down and I trained them or I taught them. Um, that, that kind of thing. And I, I think once you find that, um, then learning some of the bits and bytes is kind of the easy part. I think like that was true for me. So the, being certified and understanding different systems and that's not as important you're saying? Certainly it, it matters, okay. right? There's some like, you gotta be a guru in technology or certain kind of things. Mm -hmm. and, and this is less true for developers, right? For a software developer, you've literally gotta learn the language. right? Um, there's a there's a significant amount of IT where, um, and maybe this is what when I'm interviewing what I'm looking for is that kind of person that likes to learn, um, wants to fix things and get stuff done, and can relate to people. That uh, certainly for my story um, was a, I think a big part of how I got here. You right, know, right. the other thing I also um, I want to come back to this because I think this is kind of along the same lines. Um, Simon Sinek is a guy who writes lots of leadership books, mm -hmm. and he has one thing he says that I think is uh, really great in the IT space. He says a leader is someone who runs toward the danger first. And I love that quote uh, because in IT you find a lot of people that don't think of themselves as uh, people managers like just right. give me the computers to work on man yeah. I don't want to deal with all the people stuff right and I totally understand that because the people stuff is complicated um, the systems of people we got more bugs than computers do right? yeah. <laughs> our interfaces are worse than the way we talk to each other or go to, you know communicate um, we're, we're complex um, so a lot of IT guys check out on that but I think if you can just remember that troubleshooting um, works across every discipline, um, all kinds of engineers, medicine, uh, computers, and in people. If you can just decide, all right, I, I think I want to grow in my career uh, in IT. Uh, maybe I do want to try to break into leadership. Maybe I have a goal one day of being uh, chief information officer or technology officer somewhere. I think you can focus in on running towards the danger first and being observant, figuring out how to be influential, and then just failing forward, man. Like that's the great thing about sort of trying to troubleshoot the people side of problems, um, even the technology side of problems, is if it, if it doesn't work, the problem's still there and you can try right. again, right. you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I guess I hit a pause. Well, Jeff, I, I think that what you said was inspirational. Um, but I think there's a good touch, a stopping point, too. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for doing this, man. Yeah. I love your story. Thanks for having me on, man. Oh.